am going to let all these brilliant panelists introduce themselves one by one briefly and just talk about what the digital um, economy means for them or what the word digital means for them in terms of going truly borderless. Um, Patrick, do you want to start? Usually what happens is I'm on the panel and they pick on the woman and they say, would you like to start? Now, since I've already started, I've got to pick on someone else. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patrick Santillo. I'm from the U.S. Embassy here in New Delhi. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to turn the tables on you and allow you to ask us questions, but I'm going to start out by asking you a question. How many of you have been to a U.S. Embassy here in India or anywhere? Please raise your hand. All right, pretty good. How many of you have been to a U.S. Embassy for anything other than a visa? Please raise your hand. Uh, not quite as good. How many of you have been to a U.S. Embassy for business purposes? Okay, even fewer. So let me very briefly then say that I do represent the U.S. Embassy, but I represent one small part of the U.S. Embassy, which is the commercial section of the U.S. Embassy. We're dispatched out of the U.S. Department of Commerce, and our principal mandate is to bring U.S. companies together with Indian companies in this instance, and we really do that around the world. We do it a number of different ways that range from providing information to actually doing the matchmaking of bringing buyer and seller together. In this instance, for doing business here in India, we engage with the government of India on policy matters, as you can imagine, at a bilateral level, and newly, we also encourage Indian companies to invest in the United States. I'm not going to talk about much of any of that today, but I wanted to just put that out there, that that's what we do. If anyone would like to talk about those things, you can either ask a question or we can talk about it after the session. Digital to me, serving here in India for the last couple of years, having served across Asia for pretty much the last 40, I can say that digital to me simply means opportunity, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the panel and to learning from our panelists. Thanks very much. Rohit, please. Uh, thanks, guys, for having me here. Uh, my name is Rohit, and I lead Pioneer in India. And Pioneer is a specialized cross-border B2B payment platform, right? Uh, what we do really is our platform enables businesses and individuals who are into businesses to transact and get their monies paid from across the globe, across 200 countries, 150 currencies, in a very simple, low-cost way into their own bank accounts for whatever they want to do with it, right? Of course, we have lots of bells and whistles features and stuff like that around it, but what really digital and global means to us is to be able to break those barriers of allowing trade to happen across borders. And why is it important? Uh, if you look at e-commerce itself, one of the segments that we cater to, uh, about you know, uh, s uh, nearly 3 to 4 percent of traditional businesses really export in India. But if you look at e-commerce, about 30 to 40 percent people export. So there is a need for n those nice products, the nice pricing advantage that we have, and so on and so forth, right? About only you know, 30 to 35 percent of businesses, traditional businesses that export, really sustain them. Most of them die out over a period of time. But with e-commerce, about 80 percent people sustain their business, which is which which proves that you know there is a demand, there is a need for it, right? So we are in the midst of that to enable this demand, to enable this journey for a small, medium entrepreneur who could be a freelancer or a seller or a service provider to be able to take his business global and then also do the financial transaction to make it you know, happen for him to get, collect his money back into India. So that's what we are and that's what global and digital means for us. Prashant. I'm going to start off with what happened to me this morning. Uh, almost serendipitously, my Twitter feed showed an infographic which showed the shipping paths uh, you know, that existed 400 years ago. Uh, overlaid over the internet data cables. And uh, it was very, very interesting to see that it was almost the same, right? But then that's about where the similarity ended because there's an ocean that separates them. We all know, right, what's happening in the physical world, uh, you know, with the trade barriers coming in, uh, physical walls literally coming up, uh, preventing free flow uh, of uh, trade, uh, uh, people, uh, ideas. 
uh, and we know about solutions such as the ones that Rohit talked about, that the digital world is burgeoning ahead and is actually setting the path. This is actually the segue to the introduction of what Ideas does. We try to bridge the physical world for our clients. Our clients are typically large hotels such as these or large car parks such as the ones that exist in Heathrow, Auckland, Melbourne, Montreal. Uh, we try to bridge this gap from the physical world to the digital world using heavy analytics solutions powered by the cloud, uh, powered by uh, you know, all the computing prowess that's happened uh, over the years, cyber security. Uh, we use smart uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning kind of algorithms to make sure that this gets delivered. Uh, on a daily basis, we, we take the decisions for our clients on the price of their assets, which are the hotel rooms, right? So uh, this is where we stand, and uh, uh, I'm part of Ideas, and my name is Prashant. Excellent. Thank you. Um, my name is Harish. I am with uh, an organization called Red Hat. And I just want to pause for a moment here and you know, ask the question, how many of you have heard of the Grateful Dead? And were you aware that uh, John Perry Barlow passed away three days ago? So he, to me, was a hero. He helped define what it means to create the internet. He coined the phrase, a borderless world. He, wanted, he, he declared independence of mankind on the internet. So no controls, no governments, nothing. And the internet is really where Red Hat as a company gets its sustenance from because the internet helps create opportunities for anybody anywhere on the planet to be able to contribute code, documentation, whatever, from an open source perspective. And that brings forward the entire three areas of interest that you talked about here, your e-commerce, your data analytics, and trade issues to the front because you cannot do that kind of stuff if you do not have the vibrant open source communities out there. Every single thing, in fact, all of you sitting in the audience here have a phone that runs open source software. The question at the end of the day is, does it matter to you? What matters to you is that it works. But what is more important is the fact is you have control over the device to do whatever you want with it if you choose to do so. But that's the world that I come from and that's the world I represent. So from our perspective, it has essentially been a borderless world from day one. And because we ride it on the internet, if, you, if I were to do a very quick thought experiment for all of you, I know it's after lunch, thought experiment after you, don't fall asleep. If I were to turn off the internet now, no Wi-Fi, no 4G, nothing. I want to see what reaction it would be. I think be. half the people would have a panic attack. Right exactly. There. I yeah. think there will be a riot, there will yeah. be a panic attack, yeah. and there will be people throwing stuff at me. <laughs> I, I, I would also agree with you by saying thank you very much, yes. But the point is, that's the core of everything that we do. How many times did you check your mail this morning? Maybe just as you woke up, and so on. So that's the core. All of this is driven and built upon open source technology everywhere every single point. So that's where I come from. So I'm happy to be part of this panel to understand more. And yeah, I think I'd like to give you deference to John Perry Barlow. All right, thank you. So as someone, I'm going to start with you, Harish, since you uh, still got your mic with you. As someone who has been uh, you know, uh, a propagator of truly borderless, you know, um, I want to get the morbid stuff out of the way. I want to know about. Um, what are some of the sectors or the industries that you believe um, are going to have, you know, we keep talking about this digital world, digital economy. We're seeing this already, that uh, there are a lot of industries and sectors that had an issue uh, in terms of going truly digital. And because of that, uh, they've suffered, you know, examples of music industry mm -hmm. where a lot of the private label houses went away. Um, and similarly, now the pharma industry, which is struggling to do something about it. What are some of the industries that you predict are going to be in serious trouble? Uh, <laughs> and don't be too scary about it. We don't want people running out quickly right now <laughs> trying to act on it. But w w what are your predictions? <laughs> well, I just ran out of the batteries from my little crystal ball, so I can't turn it on now. So, but I'll try. 
a different way. I, I think the, the areas where there will probably be a bigger disruption will be probably in the medical sector because you really, really, I, I need to be a lot cleverer in how I know my own medical status. I want to know, I want to get my doctor to know what my, my health conditions are and anything related to it. I think that's going to be a big disruption because for all the alleged smarts of the medical industry, that's really in the equipment side. The diagnosis, the patient information, the, and the entire set of components there, in many hospitals, it is still very non-digital. So we need to have a way to, to mitigate and to get that aspect out into the digital space. I think that's going to be the bigger change. What would that mean to bigger hospitals? What would that mean to general practitioners? to you know, a, a medical doctors who are running their own private practice. It's going to be a very interesting time, but I think that's going to be a big But big then change. it brings us to the struggle, which is data. A lot of people have issues with all the data being digitalized and centralized. Uh, and, uh, you, know, I, you know, and here comes, I, you know, I'm just being the devil's advocate here. Uh, Aadhaar is a perfect example of this and the issues going around on that. Uh, I will just add, uh, okay, because I come from Singapore, um, we do have a data plan, a, a data protection uh, legal framework. It's called a, pri a P PDPA, Privacy and Data Protection Act. It is a very strict act. So uh, the question I have is I have to use that lens, which I'm familiar with, and look at the ADA here and see whether it passes or fails. I don't know. I have not done the, the, the analysis of that. But clearly, personal data is going to be an issue. The question is how, many, how much of us how many of us know how much of our data has already been spilled? We, have, we leave a digital trail constantly. We, we leave a di DNA trail all the time. We just walked in here. I just sat here. I have my DNA on the chair now. We all have it. Whatever your DNA is, your, it's on the chair. You touch the, the, the table, you touch the, the side of the chair, your DNA is there. It yeah. can be retrieved. We do that all the time. We have always done it. The internet is incredibly leaky from that perspective. Yeah. But do you know about it? That, that's the thing. So open source technology helps mitigate some of those things. That's what I wanted to make a point. I, I want to bring up a different perspective to that, uh, a challenge which can be solved. And I'll take my own family. For example, my father, he goes through a treatment for the last 20 years. He has a terminal illness. He's moving. He's doing fine. But uh, that persists, right? Uh, I, have five files. I have five files worth of his treatment medicines, right? And the reason that we go to the same doctor, same this thing, because only he knows the history. Yeah. Nobody else can. Imagine if it's digital, right? And it could be interpreted, uh, and it could be bucketed and segmented into various forms. Probably, you know, we could be better off in treating a person. And imagine this at scale, how it's going to work. It's, 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 it's going to be really part-changing, game-changing. Yeah in many ways. That's what yeah. they say, right? They, I mean, everybody's right now talking about Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But fact of the matter is, they say data is the new currency. Uh, anybody who's got data is going to be king, and that's how it's going to work. Um, which brings me to a question for actually both of you, and what do you think about it, is basically um, the governments are up in arms about the big five tech companies, uh, and you know, Amazon, Google, Facebook, um, all these guys, Apple, about uh, essentially the data and how much data they control. And where are we headed with that? They feel like they're becoming really powerful. If the governments are scared, should we be scared? And what does this mean in terms of digital, not digital? What do you guys want to I'm not sure whether we should be scared or not. I mean, maybe at the end of this panel discussion, we'll probably uh, decide whether that's the case or not. But I want to talk about this centralization, decentralization that you talked. So is centralization of data good or not? So if, if we do not centralize, we will not benefit from the advances of science, uh, of uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, of the advances of uh, uh, neurobiology, of you know, biotechnology coming together, making sure that we are able to model the human body. That will be very difficult to do. But at the same time, if the data, as she said, lies in the hands of a few, and they get some kind of different thoughts. You know, you could do a lot of these, lot of uh, mischief with the data. Uh, I'm going to be slightly dystopic out here uh, and uh, quote uh, the thoughts of uh, a person who's kind of recently inspired me a lot. Uh, uh, a lot of you would have read his book, The Sapiens. Uh, you know, Yuval Noah Harari. So he recently talked about uh, 
a possibility of hacking the human algorithm. So he says that every living organization, organism is an algorithm. Uh, we heard Harish just say that we are leaving a trail of DNA, uh, which means that someone is getting information about what we are doing. I just read this morning again on my Twitter feed that based on what my watch is transmitting, uh, it can predict whether I'm a diabetic or not. So someone has reached my pancreas already, right? And it won't take too long for them to reach my brain. Now that's going to be dangerous because all that we are talking about so far, you know, how do we deal with automation? We move up the value chain, right? How do we deal with smart, smartness coming in our products through AI and ML? We use our heart and hands and creativity and strategy. But then if someone is able to hack my brain, it means we are actually creating a complete different species altogether. Now, I, it's nothing to be to panic about at this point of time, but then I think everyone has a role to play. We heard in the cyber security panel that the individual has a, ro has a role to play, but it's not just the individual, right? Even the corporates need to ignite their conscience. Uh, I know there is open market, I know there is uh, profitability pressures, I know that there is pressure to get this done. But the governments have a role to play. They cannot stifle research, but at the same time, they cannot take their eyes off. And I think world bodies also have a role to play in making sure things get standardized. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next year. But then, you know, what's predicted is that it can happen in a matter of a few decades. So it's not too far away. Patrick, I'm going to ask, um, and we'll come back to this topic, but I want to talk about my favorite topic. Uh, because I think he's leveraged the digital platform very efficiently and effectively. Trump, let's talk about him and him leveraging digital, because he's done that beautifully. Um, I just, I want to understand from you in terms of um, digital propaganda, okay, and going borderless. It was the first time that I have seen the country that I absolutely love and I've studied in, uh, go almost protectionist at certain places. I just want to get your thoughts on that. It's, we're going borderless with digital, or are we kind of getting our hackles up and putting up a wall? A very easy question for the only <laughs> government guy in the room, maybe, but uh, let me do what I can with that somehow. Uh, but let me set the stage just a little bit to say, I wonder if we were in this room 100 years ago, how we would feel about automation coming our way how we would feel about lines being implemented to produce something as simple as the automobile, because that was going to revolutionize our lives. It was going to put all the horse and buggies out of business. It was going to put, you know, and on and on, every generation seems to deal with this and many of these same issues. Is it more hyper now because of the issues, or are these really the same issues? Remember when music, some of the music trends that came out, the words that were being said in the 80s about rap music were exactly identical to the music that was being played and the words that were being said about rock and roll in the 50s. Oh, it's going to warp the kids' minds. Oh, this is going to be bad for society. And so these, these discussions, I think, tend to go on and on. And I think you can sort of begin to divide the room between people who see that as an opportunity and people who are maybe a little bit more concerned about it. And each of us will ultimately, as individuals, decide where we are on that spectrum. And frankly, each of us as governments are going to decide where we are on that spectrum. And, and that is bound to ebb and flow. It, it ebbs and flows with elections. It ebbs and flows with personalities. But ultimately, it's in most free societies, it's the will of the people that's going to help determine where that line is going to go. So I think if we look at the trend lines, I frankly don't see the United States as a protectionist market. Uh, we are currently just in close to home here. We are India's number one market. India exports more to us than anywhere. So, you know, if we're so protectionist, how can it be that we're absorbing so much Indian product? And we continue to do that, and we continue to have a very vibrant and growing bilateral trade relationship. So I don't quite buy into the argument that we are very protectionist or even increasingly protectionist. And I think, again, going to the, the, the question about media, uh, whether it's social media, whether it was print media, as print media came out, as we got daily
daily newspapers. Uh, people probably back then had this same argument of, are we putting too much power now in the written word? So are we putting too much power now into the cyber word? Uh, I think people's capacity to absorb and to determine and judge all of this is, is pretty much keeping pace with the technology. You know, it's funny you're talking about uh, earlier times. Um, I was just watching an interview with Don, uh, Dan Tapscott, who did The Digital Economy. He wrote the book in 1994. And um, he's done you know, an updated version uh, called The Perils of the Digital Economy. Now it's done in 2016. And so uh, somebody who was interviewing him said, um, you know, how come you did not predict mobile being such a big force? And he said, because the mobile phone that time was attached to a wire. There was no mobile. There was no such thing. Our phone was attached to a wire. You know, I missed that one. I'm sorry. But <laughs> it's so funny. We've come from there to here. Yeah. And it's moving so fast. A absolutely. And the, the only other point I think I, I would like to make, because again, of the question about governments and kind of how they make some of their decisions, I think the U.S. really does try to represent sort of the, the multi-stakeholder approach. We try to represent uh, bringing everybody into the room, providing opportunity for notice and comment, and all of these things do take a little bit of time, but at the end of the day, we are firm believers that you actually have a better product if you do that. And we're really not about telling any one country which way it's got to go or what it's got to do, but we do find that we can remain hopeful that the community of nations, in the broadest sense, would want to come together and identify some of these trend lines that in fact can ensure the free flow of data because our economies are based on it, not just in the digital realm, but even to the manufacturing realm. We count on this open flow of data, but then how each country is going to come up with its own practices, but do that in a community of nations that we can adopt those best practices and keep the economy growing. And I firmly believe that is the approach that many of us, including India, are, are trying to take. Thank you. Um, so I know we had a panel before this about, you know, ICO and crypto and everything. Um, I want to keep it more basic, but ask a very relevant question, which a lot of my friends who are, um, you know, who don't even uh, trade, essentially, are housewives, but have become supremely interested in, which is the Bitcoin and the way it trades. Everybody knows what it's trading at on a daily basis, which I find fascinating, you know. Um, uh, what do you think? Bitcoin was supposed to be what was truly borderless, okay? And now is it just a fad or is it going to truly take us borderless? Where do you think it's going? Sure. So I I'm not going to comment on Bitcoin as good or bad probably as a, as a singular currency. Uh, but what underneath uh, the problem areas are, are it's, it's difficult to trade. Today, if a merchant wants to get paid for his sales, let's say he's, sending, he's a jeweler, he's selling jewelry from India to US, uh, the customer, the buyer there will transfer it into a corresponding bank in the US. That money will go into a corresponding bank in India, and that corresponding bank will put the money into his local account. It's archaic. It's not working, right? Uh, it's, it's difficult. And then every time he gets the money, he, you forget there's also RBI approval, by the way, I have to get that done. Sure, So that sure. also comes through. There's no, one so, more step, it goes so, so to the So you come RBI. to Payoneer, we, we have the RBI approval, we'll get it for you. Don't worry about that, right? But, but, but once, the, once the money comes in, uh, they have to go to the bank, submit like a bunch of documents, which, which are paper documents, which are not even digitalized, right? So it's really very, very old. And this is not about India, this is about how it operates in large part of the world. Uh, so there is a undercurrent of frustration with not only businesses, but even individuals, right? A son sending money to his father back from the US into India, he's working there. Uh, of course, there are good companies who do it, but it goes through a similar chain, right? Uh, some technology has to come and replace it. Uh, is blockchain and Bitcoin the right one? Probably time will tell us that, but the, the fascination or the uh, jubilation that you see with Bitcoin is all because of that frustration underlying frustration. So it's real that things are going to happen and going to change. Uh, probably too early to call whether Bitcoin is the crypto which is going to replace cash or replace credit cards and you know uh, bank money or something like that. I mean, China, they stopped QQ. Uh, yeah. They didn't stop it, but they controlled it because they 
felt it was too powerful as a uh, digital currency. So, so, so I think there is one side to be concerned because it makes it easier for fraudsters and the wrong people to come and kind of use it for the wrong stuff. Uh, but I think that's a challenge which the industry and the government is trying to solve together. And we, we love RBI when they come back and say that we want to solve this problem, we want to work with them. And we continue to work with them to solve some of these problems, right? Uh, and that is not going to go away. Even today with cash, uh, uh, do you know that about 60 to 70 percent of India's remittances are cash from globally when they come from outside, right? So you Nobody go ever the, sends me any money. Yeah, so, so if you <laughs> go to the Western Union shop, uh, most of the people who collect money, they are collecting it in cash. Prepaid cards are now something that's happening, but otherwise it's all cash. How do you, how do you, uh, do you think that cash is not going to be used in the wrong way? It's going to be used in the same wrong way as any other currency. So the risks are the same. Uh, probably uh, the way to address the risk, those risks are going to change yeah. and we should accept it, we should try and solve it. But there is no running away from the fact that there is a need for change uh, which is going to make it easier, make it low cost for individuals and businesses to kind of trade globally. And uh, I think we're going to see that change for sure. So uh, one of the countries that is uh, really pioneering on this is Estonia. They've, they've started their e-residency program which is essentially you're an entrepreneur. Um, you know, they'll let you become an e-resident and then you have global digital access. Any thoughts on, is this where we think countries in general are headed? Is that how it's gonna be? I mean, uh, you know, there's this whole trend of digital nomads, people who just can go anywhere and do their work from there. I, I aspire to be one at some point when I'm not a slave to this place, but um, what, what are your thoughts on where do you think this is headed? Are we really going to be those digital nomads and e-residents just bouncing around the globe? Because that sounds beautiful. I'll take data, my privacy, you know, going away if that it means that I could just be on the beaches of Phuket and doing work. Be, be careful what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think... <laughs> Uh, I think the bigger, big, the, big, the bigger question here, and probably this is very succinctly uh, uh, stated by Professor um, uh, Negroponte, Nic Nicholas Negroponte, who said uh, in his book uh, many years ago, he said, uh, atoms stops at the border, but the bits go right through. So if you have a borderless environment and you have a residency with Estonia, I think even Singapore, we're exploring the opportunity to have uh, residency, non-resident residents in Singapore. For, you know, if so, you're a sing technically a sort of a Singapore citizen. Uh, so with Estonia, so I have that with Estonia as well, which is interesting. But do I use it? Not really, not yet. But potentials are wonderful. I think it is going to be a very useful thing. What else can I do with it? I, you know, we are in the early days yet. So there's going to be a lot of, you know, I call this the Cambrian explosion time, where there's a, a tremendous amount of ideas being thrown out. 99% of it will just die out. And then there'll be a few nuggets that, holds, that stays on because that has some currency, some relevance, some uh, real grounding in, you know, in reality of sorts, right? Uh, and that will be what that moves forward. So to me, I'm not... I, I don't want to give up my privacy because I don't think that is the sacrifice I will, I'm prepared to We've give. We've already given it up. You told me that. No, you have not. You have not given up. <laughs> All right. I, I need to <laughs> let these not. guys get in their, their thoughts on this. And then we're quickly going to open it up for a couple of questions because uh, not me. I'm being told that we need to cut it short. So, Prashant, I'll let you take it and talk about it. No, I mean, I, I'll kind of try to address your wish as well, right? I mean, try to <laughs> extend it to the scenario. Uh, if your mind gets hacked, a part of your mind could be in Phuket. I, I, what or, is it going to do with your mind being there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or you're, you physically could be in Phuket while your mind is doing something else, right? I mean, again, that's a, uh, you know, a, a wish world. But then to the part of uh, privacy, uh, uh, you know, that an individual will get an opportunity to decide uh, what to give up and what not, I have a slightly different view because, uh, you know, we might be forced into doing it. Take healthcare as an example. If insurance companies mandate that I need to sign up for a program, I do not have a choice, right? And if such things happen across other industries, then you know we will probably have a, a very, very weak hold on what we call as privacy. So I mean that's that's my view. All right, Rohit. Um, while 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 you know there are certain elements of one's life which one wants to keep private, uh, I think it's 
it's within our control. Uh, to be honest, I've, I'm off Facebook. I save like an hour a day not going through Facebook. Uh, but that's an individual choice. But I don't worry about privacy because it's in my control. If I don't give my data to Facebook by not having an account, because it's not important for me, it doesn't matter. I think it's, it's a lot of propaganda in my mind about the risks of privacy. I don't think it's real. I think it's completely in one individual's control to kind of manage it well. Patrick. Prashant, let me reassure you, nobody wants to hack my mind, so it's not a worry for me. Uh, I, I don't think really that I can see us going away from borders and, and from some form of connectivity to our communities. Is that community always going to be a nation? Uh, maybe. Might it be a city, a town? Maybe. As, as they grow, as the metropolises grow, sure. Uh, but I think it, it, at our core, people do want to belong. Uh, I can't imagine a world, uh, and maybe that is why nobody wants to hack it, I can't imagine a world where uh, people are going to give that up. Now again, I, I work for the U.S. government, uh, I'm a U.S. citizen, have been my whole life, and, and would not reconsider that at any point. That's just me. We all have to make our decisions. Uh, but I just don't see it moving quite in that direction. And I think people have that need for family and for grounding. And I, I don't see us kind of going that direction, at least not in, in anybody in this room's lifetime. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, unless any of you